cottage here. Isn't that much a better way to give a class than a blank wall of white? Well, this is it's not going to be that much better. You'll see the sky at least until we get the, the camera crew more upgraded. So it's Yid Gimel Talmud today. It's the day that the previous Lubavitcher Rebbe was actually stepped out of exile. Um, and freedom, it's all about freedom. What do you have if you don't have freedom? In China to be a billionaire and then just be scooped up and never be seen again, is not quite worth it. So freedom. Freedom from pain and suffering and con confinement. Freedom from the pain of fasting. We're expecting to fast in four days. Um, well, we shouldn't expect that, should we? Let me just invite some, some of the main guys. Or the people beginning with letter A. So we learned about how in the year when the Rebbe spoke about the fast, the upcoming fast, it was pushed off because Shabbos was on Yud Zayin Tammuz, the 17th of Tammuz was the Sabbath. You're not allowed to fast on the Sabbath. So it was pushed off to not Yud Zayin, it's the 17th of the month, which is the Gematria of Tev. Not just good, but Chai, 18th day of the month where it's about being alive. You know, the guys with the big high in gold, but to make it something that we value inside. Chayas. So that is the good thing that exists in fasting. Welcome. A fast day, remember, is not intended to be a horror show. It's intended to be a, actually a holiday to celebrate the end of fasting, I suppose, or it somehow it becomes a noteworthy fast day, even in the times of the Mashiach, where all the other holidays are going to fade away, except Purim. But the fast days will be celebrated because there's a concept of positive associated with fasting is the hunger. It sounds like a David Bowie movie, but it's not. It's lach yesem barav to invigorate through hunger. The positive sense of that is the vitality associated with what from what drives us. So I promise you, I'd go to the source. I didn't. Pro I could say I promise you because we've already started. We on Friday we went through this mimer, this teaching of the first Lubavitcher Rebbe on the words in Shira Shirim that you're, you're beautiful, my beloved, you are beautiful, your eyes are like doves, welcome. We spoke a bit about doves, how they gaze into each other's eyes. Okay, well, no, we'll actually go through it now. I, don't, I didn't quite get to it. We spoke about how there's three colors that represent the three driving forces in the world of emotion, is the desire to give, chesed, which is white, it's pure. The desire to have discipline and contain gvura, severity, justice also, that is red. Okay, red is judgment. So you have white kindness, severity is red, and what would be in the middle, the beauty of integrating the two is green actually. So white and red is not pink, it's green. I always thought, that, wow, there's a real emphasis on pink, but on the other hand, we're not talking about the mixing of the colors, but more of a blend, a braiding of a weave, an integration. And when you do that, we learned, you soar, you, you ascend. You can't fly if you have one wing on one bird and one wing on, an, ver, wing on another bird. I suppose if they like, harness them together, it would work. So that's the third thing, I guess, is the harness. You have the three colors. It looks rather jolly, red, green, and white. <coughs> I mean that in a humorous sense. Because I was trying to get another image, so I was thinking maybe like 
red, green, and white. Like a, like a very pastoral scene of some sort. Welcome. But we're, we're invited here to see them as three fathers of our tradition, Avram, Yitzhak, and Yaakov. They each correspond to one of the three, three prayers that we say in the day, each one corresponding to those qualities, kindness, discipline, and beauty, harmony. So now I'm just going to finish the final column. I, I felt bad that we got cut off early because I had some very important missions of safeguarding the house for Shabbos and you know, making sure the alarm was not on lights go or whatever. It was... Um, so it was a good reason why I had to stop early last time. So here we're going to continue. You can just mix them in together, these two classes, and you'll get the point. We spoke about how beauty is related to compassion, and compassion is when you consider the fact, yes, I hear you, I understand the situation, so judgment, justice is an acknowledgement of what is true, and kindness has the downside of maybe giving to where it's not meant to be. So you have to mix the two, and that's compassion. So it's an awareness of the problems and a desire to incline yourself towards kindness. So it's on an angle. It's like green on an angle if you want to make a flag of this. The other place you see an angle is the Meneira, the candelabra in the Holy Temple, was on angles and straight diagonals, contrary to the Arch of Titus, which depicts it as being rounded. They were not rounded, as the Rebbe argues, so um, with such compulsion or urgency to get the right idea. He says that is a symbol of bowing because just for the sake of stylizing their victory over, the, over Jerusalem, the Arch of Titus depicts it as being rounded to just go with the whole rounded flow. It would be like, it's, it becomes an aesthetic concern rather than a, an actual, it happens to be that the art, you know, an artist doesn't know what he's doing. Think about it. They didn't have pictures. They were tons of Meneras in the rounded shape for other purposes, but in the base of Migdash, it was specifically on an angle, as were the windows that echoed forth in before it. The windows that are narrow on the inside and wide on the outside, indicating we don't need the light to come in from outside. This is the source of light. So the candelabra stretches out to shine outwards beyond the confines of a holy place. It's meant to enter and elevate the darkness of the world. That's where you can see the light most is when it's where the darkness is. Then you notice the light even more. So this verse, we said beautiful twice. You are beautiful, my beloved. You are beautiful. Your eyes are like doves. Shir Shirim, look it up. And so therefore, this that we just said, all this class till now, and Fridays as well, is talking about one type of beauty. It's the beauty of our effort. We integrate all the qualities. We balance it, and we show compassion for the plan. The plan is to make a dwelling place on earth. We have compassion for our poor soul that has traveled from the highest heights, to be invested within the lowly dark world and shine from there outwards. That's our effort. That's considered one type of beauty. The other type of beauty which contributes to this gazing of the dove eyes that King Solomon describes in Shir Shirim corresponds to the second merit that the Jewish people have on this receiving the Torah. We said Nasa. That's our effort we're going to do. It's a commitment, it's a devotion. Then we said, Nishma, we're going to listen and understand. When you listen and understand, it's the other that becomes in the spotlight. It's not the Nasa, where you, you're pushing forward, you're doing something, but rather you're in a receptive listening mode and a channeling of something a lot higher than anything that we could attain on our own. 
So that's the second type of beauty. It's the divine beauty that shines down as opposed to the effort, the beauty of effort of integrating and ascending. This is the beauty that shines down from above. There's just one column left. This is the part that's referenced in the Rebbe Sicha that we began with that speaks about to invigorate through the hunger. So you can see where it, we're hinting what the, with what the, the vitality associated with hunger is. It, happens to, it has to do with the spiritual yearning. So bear that in mind because it got a, bit, a little bit sticky last Friday. I mean, last week, just the other day when we um, tried to jump ahead. So the first beauty is corresponding to Na'aseh, which is beautiful because of what we contribute, what we do, the Alter Rebbe writes in Lekute Terah, the in our ability to express love and fear, or to experience love and fear, Barachmanas and compassion, Ledav Kabay, with the intent of cleaving to Hashem through that. So, so God sort of says, this is the character that you want to, this is the code of character for you to bring the infinity of creation into the, cre- the creation itself. I meant creator into the infinity of creation itself. I also was wrong. I think you get what I'm trying to say. To nullify your will before his. Bitzel b'mitzias. Total give, giving oneself over. Avayafa sheni. But that's our effort. The second beauty. Lepchinas yafa rishen. Kimei shamru rizal. As our sages teach. Habalatar masayin lay. One who wants to purify themselves. One who sets out to purify themselves is given help from above. So it, it is a breach of code and a hacking of the matrix. All you got to do is want to have pure motives. You're given help. To not only purify, but to sanctify the person. And that is drawing down the supernal qualities and character. So there's a divine attribute of compassion that ends up evolving or devolving more correctly into the matrix of the physical world, representing, embodying that on earth and with the ability of it going beyond what we're all, we're capable of achieving on our own, but being truly inspired and therefore super powered. That's the level of the Jewish people that are called Israel, with whom Hashem is glorified in beauty. Esper, Tiferes, beauty. So it's interesting, the third of the Chesed, Bura, Tiferes is here in focus. The integration, when, it, when there is the integration, I suppose it means when it's already achieved from the efforts of the souls in this world, then Hashem shines through and kickstarts it. Becoming an embodiment of the supernal welcome, the supernal um, reality of Yisrael. Yisrael alo alu b'machshava that the Jewish people, the souls, went up in Hashem's thought when he had the good idea to that to rule the world. So he's going to create a world to rule and bring that about through the souls of the Jewish people. The souls of the Jewish people therefore come from a divine origin that's perfection and divinity, but requiring our... Here we're not talking about what we do, but rather what um, is accomplished through Hashem making it happen by the form of Yisrael, as it is in perfect divin- divine heavenly form, is aligned with what's ever happening here in your den. Kisarisa Imlakim, because you have fought with 
the forces in the world called the Elohim. That's what Yisrael means. Yisrael means I've been victorious. You've, I've confronted. Kechas and Yechayin Pe'er Lecha Hashem Agdula Agvurat Feres like a groom, like a chassan, he um, is the, the kohen who, to whom is beauty, greatness, might, tiferes. The Knesset Yisrael and the Jewish souls, Hainu Shemakambelis HaPe'er Mimpikinus Yisrael, receive this divine beauty from the Yisrael de la'elo, the supernal version of a, what a Jew is. V'zewinin hanach yafa sheni. That's the second reference to this verse in Shir Shirin that says, Thou art truly beautiful, my darling, as the translation had it. Said twice, you are truly beautiful. The second reference here is this sort of shining back from the divine beauty, the supernal image of the of Yisrael. And that's the concept of Yifas Tayar. The, the Terah's acknowledgement of beauty in the mothers. Be'inyin Rachel, Haisi Yifas Tayar, Yifas Mare, who is said to be beautiful and shining of countenance. So Rachel was an embodiment of divine beauty and is expressive of what that represents. It's the it's the, the response from our efforts. Now Hashem lights up the process, shining beauty into the of the Jewish soul into the person. And that's what's described in, on the verse, how beautiful, another word, of, in another verse rather, in Shira Shirim, it says, how beautiful and how glorious is the love of delights. So when someone has the love of finite physical things, it gets this good, right? The love of delights, when it refers to spiritual divine pleasure, is... Firstly, infinite, but also it applies to something that is um, not necessarily a tangible thing. It's not like you get, but here it's an engaging experience of the soul. So when you're completely attuned to what's going on in the soul, you'll feel what the soul feels. What is that? the love of delights, when it's no effort anymore, when you're totally lit with inspiration from above and everything is pleasurable. So do you understand that? It's It's not talking about a Vedas Hashem that's difficult. It's the only thing you love is serving Hashem. That's what you love. And when you love something, you have pleasure in being involved with it. If anyone's met, married their Beshertar, They'll know what I'm talking about. It's a love of delights. You find your, the other half of your soul, what an incredible miracle that is. When you realize that the Terran Mitzvahs is your soul, and, and it is your Beshertar, it's your intended. Welcome. When it, you recognize that it is the intended, then you love everything to do with Hashem, everything to do with His glorious, true religion of Judaism. And the beauty, welcome, the beauty of the Alter Rebbe's familiarity with these holy states of spirituality. It's intended to speak to us and be accessible to us in a way that never has before in history. And if you've ever looked at your computer and see what it could do now for the good, if you just were so inclined, I try to prove that every day and I have a new project in mind that's going to blow away a lot of people, please God. And I want to use kids to do it. Not to chas v'shalom put us make a sweatshop, but to give kids a project that's something positive that they could use technology for, as opposed to the tremendous challenges that they have today. 
What a delight it will be when they see what, that they could be the ones that are teaching the entire community. They do not have to be taught anymore. They can teach, and I, I want to prove this. So that is the beauty associated with nishma. I will hear, I will understand. Not what we do by saying, I'm going to do this. It's hard for me, else it wouldn't have to be doing it. It would just happen. It's difficult to say nasa, I'm going to do. But to say nishma means I will listen and you'll be filled up with wisdom. Nishma is giving meaning to what we do. Therefore, it becomes delightful because you understand, you feel. Av batanugim, you feel what it means to fulfill your purpose in the world. It's not just a purpose that you cash in on thousands of years later when your soul checks in and cashes out of Las Vegas. You know, the, the, the ricocheting world that we live in. But an appreciation of every moment as a divine miracle. You see Hashem in everything we described. And we learned, I think, the Shabbat, so maybe I didn't describe it to you. So that is beauty that's divine inspired. Nothing to do with what you've exerted yourself because that's already cashed in. Now, this is what you've cashed in. You've cashed in a divine embodiment of beauty. As it says on the verse, I guess the Alter Rebbe is referring to his own explanation of another verse in Shir Hashirim, on the verse that says, Yonasi, my dove, which talks about a, an attractive vision or uh, appearance. Umarecha nava, your appearance is one that attracts. The fact that the verse says, your eyes are doves, that's like the way of an analogy. A pair of doves. Male and female. And the female receives inspiration or influence from the Zachar. So there's a transference, there's a dynamic. So too by way of the interpretation of this analogy, Lamaila above, Hakadosh Baruch Hu Nim Shalachasim, Hashem is the, the groom on high, the Knesset Yisrael, the Jewish soul, Nim Shalalakala is the bride, the Hemni Kru Bechinas Mekablin, who receive. So these doves have a relationship of giving. It, it actually goes both ways. We'll see. Mekadosh Baruch Hu, the Kamayyanim Shemestaklin Zed. Like doves who gaze upon each other, kach mikol davar. So too, okay. Here's the teaching that I learned that I just referenced. Here it is, kach mikol davar yuchlu l'stakel. So the gazing of the doves is 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 telling you that there's a way to gaze at the world, what's now called the universe in uh, New Age language. That when talk when you want to talk about Hashem's interacting with the world, it's called the universe, with a capital U. You could say the you, meaning you, if you're Jewish at least, the, the Torah teaches us that, I guess you could say everyone has the same perspective because it comes from Adam Arishan, the first man, the father of all humanity, had this idea that the world was created for him. He was created one. It wasn't created Adam and Chava even. It was just one person. Not Adam and Eve, but just Adam who contained Eve as part of him. So all of humanity has the ability to say, Bishvili nivra ha'ilam. The world was created for me. What does it mean, the world? It means the narrative that's simply a concealment of the realization that there's one Hashem. It's all about the author of the world. So the Matrix has someone who's, cat, not someone, but Hashem, who's creating a code, literally creating the world that we live in. When you see the authorship of Hashem in everything, that means the helm of the oilam, the concealment that the world, the matrix is, becomes the means to 
connect you with the, the awareness of the authorship of Hashem and everything. So in everything that you gaze at, like doves gave it, gaze at each other, the Leroy is Sheina and Mavadi, and see that there's nothing else except Hashem. That is the entire, you can't look anywhere without seeing that. Anything you do is connected 100% with this awareness. To be completely in flow with that reality. To the extent that you don't have any will that's separate from Hashem. It becomes, you totally inherit this infinite will and wisdom that's from Hashem's perspective down. That's why the verse says, your eyes are doves, welcome. Your eyes are doves. Because the doves, it's plural, because it's referring to male and female. Who always gaze at each other. You can tell someone's um, pronouns just by the way you walk in a crowd and where your eyes are naturally inclined to. The doves are drawn, male to female polarities, just um, vortex into each other. Shemestaklim tamid zeb zeb, the altar writes. They're constantly gazing one at the other. Misangim bariyasim, taking delight in seeing that. They're gazing into each other's eyes and just delighting in that, the unity that that engenders. Zeh zeh, one to the other. Kach knatsis Yisrael, so too the Jewish people, the Jewish souls. Hu bechinas lestaklim bekar demalko. When you get in touch with, with the Jewish soul, what it's intended to teach us or, or help us experience, tune into, that's called gazing at the glory of the king. So if you want to know what you're looking for when you're looking for your soul, it's the experience of gazing at the glory of the king. It's the dove eyes taking pleasure in connecting. So you're connecting with the king, the creator, in this process, in this hispaininess. And in every single thing you could see and gaze at the fact that there's nothing else except Hashem. As it says, eye to eye you will see, ayin ba'ayin yiru, perish, meaning ayin harishen, it says eye to eye, who are the two eyes? Who is taklus no matzalamailo, that's our effort to gaze up to Hashem. The base and the second gazing, who has shpa no mailo? Hello? Thank you, Andrew, for taking care of this, because we're live, we're going, we're live here. <laughs> so what does it mean eye to eye you will see it means the first eye is what we contribute and the second is the influence that comes down from what that reciprocates you look at someone you're going to have it has an impact no matter what even if it's unless it's an AI like an Android or something there's going to be a response so when you gaze at Hashem it for sure has a, re- a response to see eye to eye, as we say with the mitzvah to go to the Holy Temple three times a year on holidays, is just like you've come to be seen, you come to see. There's a give and take. There is an awareness that reflects not only being seen, but seeing. It's a two-way, so ayin ba'ayin yiru, eye to eye, eye within an eye more correctly, meaning that the eye that sees is the eye that is seen. Woo! <laughs> okay, it's, it pays to be out here by the lake. Mezeo ayin Hashem el as it says, the, the eye of Hashem is to those who revere him those who yearn for his benevolence, his kindness. And in so doing, they save themselves from the death of their souls. And it explains why. Because when you're in a matrix, there's a whole spectrum of possibility. Some is good, 
some is not as good. That's called its legs descend into death. So the spectrum starts with life and goes all the way to something called Mavas. Because the way Hashem set up the universe is that the energy that chains down, that comes from a very lofty, spiritual, inaccessible reality into one that is a simple narrative that's hacked out on a matrix, that has very real and dangerous opposing forces called klippa. As it says in the Torah, behold, I have given before you today, or no, see, okay, behold, I have given before you today life and good and death and bad. But choose good, we are told. So, there is the possibility of hazard in the physical world, and Hashem gives us some good advice that we should choose the life, and that will make it work. As it says in another place, But by yearning for Hashem's chesed, to see Hashem's kindness and everything, as I then, you're saved from this whole system where there is the possibility for real hazard, you fix the system in your favor and the bullets don't quite reach you. So in a world that's ricocheting, sweet child in time, and you have to bow your head, you have to humble yourself to not get hit by the ricochet, you are saved when you stand upright. That's in the world called the Malakalama, as Hashem integrates with the physical reality not just transcends it, which means that it's not going to end in death. The legs are not going to send, descend into death. Remember we said before that legs represent the extension of the will of the Father. We said that a, a son is like the leg of his father, we learned. As it says in the verse, I have washed my foot. So you, the foot represents the possibility for hazard, Remember the pitfalls of life, the stumbling blocks that you're vulnerable to because your feet are just these two little paws that sort of hop us around in the world. When you clean that meaning you are inspired even in that world and you don't succumb to death. So what we're, that's the connection here to the sort of lack of vitality associated typically with fasting because the fast day, as we said, is approaching in four days. So Barav, the Alter Rebbe here teaches, and the Rebbe cited this, that when a person becomes invigorated through hunger, because we're told that a, per, a man does not live on bread alone, which refers to tero. So there's something that is on a higher level still. A person lives because of the connecting his soul with his body, which happens when you eat bread or, by extension, any nutrition. It joins your soul with your body. The tera is analogous to that. And that's why we say the first reference to beauty in this verse we started with is associated with na'ase. We will do the statement of devotion that sort of a, a dent that um, characterizes the Jews' commitment to Hashem at Mount Sinai, Na'ase, I will do. But that's not the only source of light. Not just on bread alone, but rather on all that comes out of Hashem's mouth. So there's sort of like the possibility to get vitality from everything. Even the hunger of not having physical bread, but here said with reference to fasting, so you withhold yourself from physical bread because there's another source of vitality in the world, and that's on everything that comes out of Hashem's mouth. That's the divine influence that reaches the world. That comes from above. Which is the beauty that this verse repeats the word, you are beautiful, associated with the beauty of nishma, of understanding, of hearing, of learning. So there's doing and then there's learning, there's understanding, there's awareness. 
There's the ability to ascribe meaning to what you do. And therefore it's not any more a submission, but um, a representation. You're listening, you're embodying, you're not doing anymore. It's a lit response of the soul when it's charged from its, the Creator. Which is the, t- the part of Torah that's associated with actually articulating the words? So there's the ideas, and then there's the simple articulation of it. Because we said, Hashem creates with His speech, so He gives bread, but He also creates the entire world, not just bread, through speech. And that's reflected, remember we say that Hashem looks into the Torah and creates the world, it's the blueprint of creation. The, that fact is more associated with the actual uttering of the words of Torah. I think here it's contrasted with the ideas behind them. In the same way that it emphasizes the reality of creation that's as, associated with God's articulating the ten utterances with which he created the world, as opposed to just the general idea that set the process in motion, I want to rule, God says. That's reflected in, as the verse says, the words that I've placed in your mouth, answer my tongue, your sayings. In other words, you become inspired and the conduit for divine wisdom. And remember, this is the promise of Torah Chadasha that everyone's going to be inspired to contribute to the Torah. And if it happens through an AI, or if that's like, even if that's the Be'ita version, sort of the last final way that Mashiach can happen, the least miraculous way, so you need technology to express this, at least it's a ge'ula. If it didn't, if it doesn't happen through outright prophecy, to put a child on a machine that can help it be the teacher for the entire community of adults, Torah, that, that makes sense, that's presentable with illustration even. I'm hinting at my idea again. Be tuned, stay tuned to hear what I'm going to unleash, please God. So this is how we're supposed to approach the fast day approaching on Yud Zion Tammuz. Because there is an invigoration, uh, a, a revival, a, a source of life that's associated with the hunger. Lach yesem of the verse says to give them life through hunger. Shachayas shalahamu b'chinas hara'ab gufa. That the vitality comes from the hunger itself. So you get vitality from eating, right? But there's a hunger in wanting to eat. There's an, a vitality, rather, in wanting to eat. There's a sort of an urgency of a hunger that's, in a way, it's... Think about ambitious young people that go into the workforce, how much energy they have to, um, to prove themselves. The hunger for... That's the first thing you ask when you're hiring something, or you don't, you don't ask it outright, you just have it in the back of your head. How hungry is this person to prove themselves? Get, how do you get your money's worth out of somebody if you're an employee, employer? Um, the, the energy associated with hunger is more than the energy you get from the actual food. Meaning here, to the extent that you are hungry and thirsty towards Hashem. That's the verse that says, hungry, even thirsty, their souls, within them, he will clothe himself. Perish, nafsham, mevur lamayla. When we speak about the soul, that's explained above, the altar of the rites here. Behem tisatav, so the latter part of the birth that says, in them, in those souls, they, Hashem will enclose themselves, meaning, as it says, nafshei nachik sol Hashem, our souls um, yearn for the taste of Hashem. We learned the chik is is the chaych, the the, uh, the ability to taste on it, the tongue. So our souls are like yearning for the taste of Hashem, I suppose is 
the way to understand it here. And that's why the verse says in reference to manna that God answered you and caused you to hunger and fed you man or mana. To teach us that God doesn't create just with a regular natural order where you can have wheat and make that into bread, but Hashem can create a miraculous um, 3D printed miracle food. And then the second example is Yom Kippur. So we're taught we're facing a fast day. Yom Kippur is the model of all fast days. It's the only fast day that's from the, the, the Torah proper, the five books of Moses, is Yom Kippur. And that's supposed to be the, the uh, awareness. The soul is above anything to do with the world. It's at the level of Yechida, where it's above eating and drinking. So when Hashem lights that up in us, and it's not about us and our efforts to achieve that, but it's just the sort of, okay, this is what you have accomplished through all your life, our lives. Um, it's a, an energy that's beyond anything that earthly nutrition can provide. It's something that exists in everything it's associated with awareness that Eino Levade in every single thing, in every corner we look in, there's, there could be the awareness that there's nothing but Hashem. So no matter how microscopic you're in, you're in focus and your attention is to details or a specific um, genre of life experience, like the nine to five person or the, or the stay at home mom, which is a whole reality unto itself, Wherever you are and whatever you go through, that's w with or live through the awareness that there is only Hashem. And this is the narrative that the authorship of Hashem is packing out for your life right now. And you have the ability to connect to Hashem infinitely in each moment. I hope that wasn't too much um, for you to swallow in one class. So thank you for tuning in and uh, hopefully we'll hear more together um, in this beautiful setting as such. Have a good day.